Добрый день! Вы на канале Мирдин, и сегодня я хотел бы рассказать о том, как я поучаствовал в конференции, устроенной американскими историками и филологами, и какие впечатления я оттуда почерпнул. Мне всегда казалось, что мы в России смотрим на западную науку снизу вверх, и в некоторых областях знаний действительно американские или европейские ученые опережают нас. Например, мне, как медиевисту и специалисту по европейскому средневековью, всегда приходилось прочитывать очень большое количество литературы на языках. Например, вот такую стопку литературы пришлось купить некому бедному аспиранту для того, чтобы написать свою кандидатскую диссертацию. Но в ноябре этого года мне посчастливилось столкнуться с западной наукой лицом к лицу, и, честно говоря, я испытал противоречивые чувства. Говоря о конференциях, не стоит думать, будто бы мне не с чем сравнить. За последние три года я успел побывать на конференциях в РГГУ, МГУ, в Высшей школе экономики и в родном Ивиран. Конференции в МГУ я горжусь, ведь организатором там выступил мой первый научный руководитель, Всеволод Матвеевич Володарский, крупный советский историк искусства. Всем, кто увлекается искусством эпохи Ренессанса, настоятельно советую вместо Паула Волковой статьи Володарского и его супруги. Лидии Михайловны Брагиной. На конференциях в Иран я имел счастье выступать со звездами отечественной науки. Со Светланой Игоревной Лучицкой, Еленой Давыдовной Браун, Дельшат Дагановной Харман, Александром Евгеньевичем Маховым, Ириной Игоревной Варьяш. В вышке, оказавшись в кругу философов и филологов, я, как видите, заскучал. Впрочем, напрасно. Из нее казалось, что самые важные, самые передовые исследования и самые крупные специалисты на Западе. Например, именно немецкие и французские философы, историки культуры и искусствоведы разработали направление, занимающееся изучением коллективной памяти. Об этом я вкратце рассказывал в одном из своих старых роликов, на который вы прямо сейчас можете кликнуть в правом верхнем углу. Вот в зарубежной филологии и исторической науке появилось такое понятие, как медиевализм, которым обозначают наши современные представления о средних веках и соответствующую дисциплину, занимающуюся их изучением. Медиевализм ни в коем случае не надо путать с медиевистикой. Медиевисты занимаются изучением средневековья, средневековых источников, а не его образом. А вот все то, что мы находим в литературе, живописи, архитектуре, моде, кинематографе и даже в играх, это некие общие места, тот самый медиевализм, то, что существует в представлениях людей о средневековье. Есть стереотипы, есть мифы. Есть два базовых мифа – черная легенда, рожденная в эпоху гуманизма и просвещения, и противоположный ему романтический миф о прекрасном, чудесном средневековье. Не стоит думать, будто бы в России это направление осталось незамеченным. Одна из конференций, упомянутой мною Высшей школы экономики, так и называлась «Как создается современное средневековье» или «Medievalism Studies». Открывал конференцию Михаил Анатольевич Бойцов, крупный медиевист. Там же выступали Сергей Аркадьевич Иванов и Олег Сергеевич Воскобойников, а также Михаил Владимирович Дмитриев. Где-то между ними затесался и ваш скромный слуга. На этой конференции обсуждались такие вопросы, как средневековье в образовательной системе, в политическом дискурсе, в историческом реконструкторстве, в музыке, в литературе и кинематографе. Чего-то подобного по тематике я ожидал и подавая заявку на конференцию о медиевализме в США. Конференция в этот раз проводилась в Дельта колледже Мичиганского университета. Это такой небольшой университетский центр между городами Сагино и Бэй-Сити на берегу озера Гурон. Странности начались уже с регистрации. Мне предложили выбрать предпочтительные местоимения из десяти, среди которых были совсем уж фантастические варианты вроде Зир, Пер, Хум, последнее, наверное, что-то из Пелевина. Дальше больше. Вместо вступительного слова нам рассказали о том, какие племена коренных американцев обитали на том месте, где теперь находится колледж. По всей видимости, мы должны были испытать некую жалость к ним. В первой секции конференции американский филолог рассказала нам о некоем рыцаре-трансгендере. На самом деле, в основе доклада лежал французский роман 13 века о переодетой даме. Ну, что-то вроде нашей девицы-кавалеристки Дуровой. 
В угоду времени героиня романа и его современных пересказов превратилась в трансгендера, определяющего себя как «они». Ну и, конечно, как настоящий угнетенный геймер, не мог я пройти мимо секции, посвященной играм. Там кучерявый молодой человек из одного американского университета увлеченно обличал игру Dante's Inferno и Kingdom Come Deliverance за то, что женщины в этих играх выступают объектами и могут быть партнерами в романтических отношениях с главным героем. Одними из немногих интересных информативных докладов мне показались сообщения коллег из Польши и из Англии. Историки и филологи Старого Света явно выигрывали на фоне представителей Канады и США. В целом, конференцию, безусловно, можно назвать международной. Там были представители Греции, Германии, Италии, Тайваня, Дании, Израиля, Швейцарии и многих других стран. Тем не менее, направление гуманитарной науки в США я бы не назвал созидательным и перспективным. Вместо того, чтобы анализировать явление культуры и выяснять причину той или иной интерпретации средневековых мотивов в современном искусстве, представители науки занимаются критикой, идеологической пропагандой и навязывают этому самому искусству свои собственные идеи и ценности. Это заставляет, ну, по крайней мере, меня, Совсем по-другому и даже с некоторой надеждой смотреть на отечественную науку. Я, кстати, был ее единственным представителем на этой конференции и, надеюсь, не опозорился. Впрочем, так ли это вы можете рассудить сами, так как я решил оставить на память это выступление и сделать к нему субтитры. В своем докладе я рассказываю об образе средневековья в советской контркультуре. Смотрите, наслаждайтесь и не забывайте ставить лайки и подписываться на канал. Hi, I'm grateful to speak here, and my theme today is the medievalism in Soviet culture, and specifically in uh, Soviet unofficial culture of the stagnation period of the Brezhnevian era. Uh, these two decades are traditionally a period that is known for uh, restricting political freedoms in the USSR and Eastern Europe. But this era is also responsible for the birth of a new culture, opposed to the official propaganda And in the coming years of Perestroika and Yeltsin Russia, this new culture was destined to be dominant. But this non-conformist culture wasn't homogeneous. It was a mix of every prohibited particle, political and religious dissidents, Western pop culture, modern art and so on. And the representation of the European Middle Ages in this culture is also extremely ambivalent. Soviet historiography and literature were constructing and promoting the Dark Ages myth about oppressive and religious medieval society with the Inquisition and impoverished peasantry, but sometimes this weapon could be turned against uh, the government and Soviet ideology itself. Uh, for example, If we, uh, uh, if we uh, analyze the literature and poetry of Soviet unofficial culture, Uh, there is a, a novel published by uh, two young sci-fi writers, Trugatsky brothers, in 1962 by the name of Escape Attempt. In this novel, three Earthlings land on a primitive, fragilistic planet, and the authoritarian ruler of the planet exploits the population to size the futuristic, everlasting machines left by aliens. To do so, he organizes the concentration camps. The only hero of the novel who understands the horror of situation is a triumph traveler from the past and a runaway from Nazi camp. Originally, Strugatsky wanted him to be a Soviet prisoner dissident, similar to the uh, Solzhenitsyn Ivan Denisovich, but uh, changed this due to censorship. Another interesting detail uh, is the cause for locking up uh, people in work camps on this planet. It's the desire for odd, uh, which is synonymous translation for the dissent in Russian, It's uh, in a kamyslia, which translates thinking otherly. <clears throat> so, the next novel by Strugatsky Brothers, Hard to be a God, published in 1964, follows the path of those who think otherly. The main hero, Don Romato, or Anton, is an undercover agent from Earth who tries to save educated and creative individuals from another um, medieval cruel society on a, a faraway planet. Initially, this novel was meant to be more light-hearted and adventurous, but after the Manesh affair in 1962, when Khrushchev critiqued avant-garde artists, 
The plot was changed by Strugatsky to reflect a more somber, more pessimistic view on the relations between the government and the individual. Uh, the antagonist in this novel is the state, represented by Prime Minister Don Reba, which uh, was named Rebia in first drafts, uh, and it's an obvious parallel to Lavrin Tiberia, the notorious uh, government uh, figure. The fabricated cases uh, of royal poisonings in the novel is a reference to the doctor's plot, the last of Stalin purges. But the main focus of the narrative is uh, on the main character. It's Don Romata, and he is a brave knight who resembles a dissident, helping others to flee the country. He is smart, lonely, and morally superior to the inhabitants of this semi-totalitarian state. It's a common trope for a dissident used in literature, non-fiction, and cinema of this period. For example, we can remember uh, Tarkovsky's uh, uh, Andrei Rublev. Uh, Grigory Pomeranz, in his 1981 essay, The Price of Renunciation, compares dissidents to the free-thinking heroes of the past, particularly to Joan of Arc, Giordano Bruno, and Tommaso Campanella. Another Soviet poet and dissident Yuli Kim would picture a chaotic character in his 1980 song Lonely Night, The main theme of the song is worthlessness of fighting with a force with a force that is bigger than the hero, but this fact doesn't stop the hero. Uh, the overall picture in the poetry and prose that I've listed is an individual fighting an authoritarian government, and the latter is uh, uh, symbolized sometimes by cruel and obscurantist medieval society. Uh, but uh, Strugatsky, in the novel Hard to be a God, also proposes an alternative. Uh, there are countries, San and Irukan, that surround Arkanar, and they are being medieval but more enlightened, and they give shelter to Arkanar dissidents. This concept introduces the other Soviet point of view on European Middle Ages. It's not only the territory of an oppressive state, but also it can represent something exotic, mysterious and unknown. Uh, West with the capital letter. Russian history didn't have a medieval period, it was officially called Ancient Rus, so the Middle Ages were associated with strictly with something European. So the Dark Ages, where everything is controlled by the church and government, and Medieval West, the unknown and the country of freedom, were two inter interpretations of this era that coexisted and conflicted in an official Soviet culture. For example, Soviet poet David Samoylov uh, at first used medieval imagery to depict the horror of the Great Purge in his 1938 and published poem Carpenters, Plotniki. It tells about an execution from the point of the protagonist. Uh, he sees, quote, the headsman hooded with a mask as not to be ashamed, not to get dirty wearing leather gloves, the end of quote. After the World War II and Khrushchev's thaw, Veteran Samoylov decides not to hide his discontent with party politics and becomes close friends with Ilya Ehrenburg and Andrei Sakharov, the famous dissidents. He supports, during the trial, his friend, Soviet writer and dissident Yuli Daniel in 1966, and in 1968 he doubles down during the trial of Ginsburg and Galanskov. This causes the censorship of his recent book of poems, Equinox, and after 1974, he moves from Moscow to Pyarno in Estonia, a phenomenon that is commonly known at the time as inner emigration. Uh, another element of the medievalism in Soviet culture is uh, the Baltic region. Mm, at this period of time, it is most uh, known f f uh, among the Soviet people uh, as a representation of European medievalism. There were short, uh, most commonly known Soviet historical and fantasy movies, Samoylov, uh, Samoylov's poem Last Holidays, written in 1972, also takes place in Eastern Europe. According to the plot, the protagonist and 16th century Czech sculpture, sculptor White Stoss travel across the Poland, uh, Bohemia and Germany. The author, Samoylov, contrasts modernity, where are, quote, only boredom and people with fish blood, with Middle Ages, where, quote, the universal spirit of Tevin reigns, the end of quote. 
other um, other words that characterize medieval West in this poem that it has clear sky and that there one can breathe easily. Due to such tropes, medieval West becomes an escapist dream of something liberating and giving freedom to develop and express yourself. And indeed, uh, uh, in part, medieval heritage gave young poets an opportunity to support themselves through literary translation of medieval and medievalistic European literature. Poets that weren't allowed in the Soviet Writers' Union had to earn for a living by translating. Among those who translated in 1970s, medieval and Renaissance authors were Yuna Moritz, Eugene Witkowski, Novella Matveyeva, Vilgelm Levik, Olga Sidakova and other nowadays proclaimed Russian poets. Another inspiration of Soviet medievalism was not the medieval literature, but the literature of European Romanticism. For example, previously mentioned uh, Yuli Daniel translated Robert Burns' ballads that were published even in Soviet press under the pseudonym Yu Petrov. Widely popular was Scott's Ivanhoe that was printed in USSR eight times in a brief period between 1969 and 1984. Here are some illustrations from it. Sometimes translation of romantic poems gave an inspiration for something new, something avant-garde. For example, young avant-garde poet Mikhail Sakavnin began with translating Tennyson's Arthurian poems in the 70s. While doing it, he wrote his own experimental poem about the life of Joan of Arc, the Virgin of Orleans, Arianska Deva, which would be published many years after his early death in 1975. Many of these poets were banned in Soviet print, uh, so there were only two ways that could, they could express themselves, Tamizdat and Samizdat, self-printed underground press outside and inside the Soviet Union. Tamizdat was tied up with uh, the early men already mentioned concept of medieval West. For example, some of Samoilov's works were published in Tamizdat. And some as that uh, can be associated with something I may call medievalistic magic realm, the territory of a new and prohibited religious and fantasy literature that spread in the Soviet Union. Specifically, through some as that, Soviet readers would find out about the birth of a new genre of fantasy novels. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia were translated and self published between 1973 and 1978 in the congregation of uh, the priest Alexander Meng. Uh, the main translator was Natalia Trauberg, who was a Catholic and lived just like Samoilov in the Baltic region, in Lithuania. Previously she translated mostly Catholic writers for Soviet um, publishers. Uh, among those were Graham Greene, Paul Gallic and Chester Tone. Catholicism was another element of medievalistic imagery in Soviet culture. It was an exotic system of beliefs associated with Lithuania, Poland and Czechoslovakia, the near abroad. Uh, 1970s popular Yuri Visbor's son, Catholic Church, describes a Catholic woman as tantalizing and completely mysterious for the Orthodox believers and for the Russians, for Soviet uh, people. Uh, at the same time, Narnia, for Orthodox and Catholic believers, was not only a fantasy, a fairy tale, but a Christian parable, an important apologetic weapon. That's why, despite the publication of Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe in 1978 in Soviet uh, publishing industry, Trauberg and her colleague Shapochnikova made their own Samizdat version of the translation, because in the Soviet edition all Christian symbolism was neutralized. At the same time, Narnia was a closet land, a very compelling metaphor of escapism, of inner immigration, and of intimate relationship with God. <clears throat> uh, not accidentally, the translator of another classic fantasy novel, Vladimir Muravyov, was also a Catholic, and was also related to the distant movement. Uh, he had an, an idea of translating The Lord of the Rings since 1974, Two years later, he published uh, the first article about Tolkien in Soviet press. The same year, he found himself a collaborator, Andrei Kistikovsky, and they started working on the translation together. However, Kistikovsky was a censored translator and a very public anti-Soviet political activist. In 1976, he translated Arthur Kersler's 
novel Darkness at Noon that was published in Samizdat and Tamizdat. Due to translation of anti-totalitarian novel, Kistikovsky was banned from Writers' Union. Nevertheless, uh, Moraviov decided to publish the translation of Lord of the Rings properly and officially, so the moment of its publication was delayed till 1982. Meanwhile, uh, Tolkien and his works started to accumulate a cult following in USSR. In 1977, first proper translation of The Lord of the Rings by Grusberg started to circulate in Samizdat. In the same years, uh, we can place the birth of Tolkien Phantom. The same time that Muravyov published his article about Tolkien, young philologist Sergei Koshelev wrote a graduation work about The Lord of the Rings and made a translation of two, its two chapters. Uh, studying in Moscow, Koshlev and his uh, friends gathered to discuss the novel and difficulties of its translation, and in a while they became obsessed with the lore of the book, uh, so the first communities of uh, Tolkien fans uh, arose in 1980s in the Moscow State University. After graduation, Koshlev returned to Chelyabinsk and wrote a doctoral thesis about the philosophy of fantasy novels in 1983. But the most significant thing that Koshlev is known for uh, is his song The Road Goes Ever On that he wrote on Tolkien's verses. Here um, we can point out that the music was another sphere that, uh, in which uh, one could find medievalistic motives. In 1970, uh, label Melodia released an album Lute Music of 16th 17th century where one could find late medieval melodies like Turdion and Galeard, and other compositions that were initially attributed to uh, several Renaissance and Baroque composers. They were actually written by an outsider Russian musician, Vladimir Vavilov. He knew that an album of archaic and religion, religious music uh, wouldn't be published under his name. He wasn't a member of Soviet uh, Composers' Union, so he perpetuated a hoax. At the time, nobody knew about it. He died three years after, in 1973, and his mystification would be all only re revealed in 2000s. This album uh, was uh, in a cult status for some time. The main joke at the time about bringing your date home would be would you like to listen to the lute music of 16th century? So it was rare and popular. In 1972, two Leningrad poets, Alexei Khvastenko and Anna Valachonsky, set their lyrics on Vavilov's melody Kansona uh, and created the well-known in USSR song The City of Gold. Other popular melody that you may know, Ave Maria, would gather international fame due to Latvian singer, opera singer Inessa Galante. Uh, the first song, City of Gold, would become, in 1975, a part of the repertoire of the newborn Soviet rock band Aquarium that you can see on the screen. It would be their most well-known hit in Perestroika and is still uh, a very popular song. They, in 1981, recorded other two pieces, an instrumental composition Guinevere with Celtic motives from album Triangle, and another song called Death of King Arthur, which consisted of the lyrics from Mallory's uh, poem. Uh, and this interest in uh, medievalistic motives from Bavilov and Aquarium isn't phenomenal. We can see the same tendencies in visual art too. Um, for example, Soviet artist Dmitry Zhilinsky created in 1973 a painting Sunday, which was unusual in technical way, it was a temper on the wood, but also visually it reminds the works of Botticelli, Uccello or Van Eyck's. Similar medievalistic and fantasy-like motives could be found in the music of mentioned Aquarium on their next album of 1982, Acoustic. This tape could be called the first example of folk rock in USSR. Uh, but the alternative uh, representation of Middle Ages as something dark, scary and oppressive can also be found in the music and poetry of early 1980s. Formed in 1978, first Soviet Gothic and art rock band Picnic was named after one of the Strugatsky novels, and on their second album, Wolf's Dance, there is a song by the name of Inquisitor. 
The lyrics told the story of a man tortured by the Grand Inquisitor, demanding his victim to confess him all thoughts and secrets. This song was created during the leadership of Yuri Andropov, the former chairman of KGB, who in 1983 started so-called anti-loitering campaign, during which many Soviet rock musicians, artists and dissidents were prosecuted. This political climate actualized again the Dark Ages myth in poetry and music. The next year, the band Picnic would be also critiqued in Soviet press and banned from multiple uh, music festivals. But of course, the most influential for the coming years representation of Middle Ages is uh, medievalistic magic realm, the fantasy uh, representation, due to the growing popularity of fantasy fiction. For example, the already uh, mentioned uh, Aquarium on their album Taboo of 1982 uh, featured an instrumental, instrumental composition Ramadairel with Baroque and medievalistic motives and very curious name. The leader of the band, Gavin Shikov, would later characterize this piece as Tolkien's Coda. It wasn't a coincidence. At last, a Moravyov translation of Lord of the Rings was published in 1982. The book was named Custodians, Hranitele, and uh, it adapted uh, the Fellowship of the Ring for the Russian readers by making some major changes in the names, the toponyms and author's terms. But the political activity of Andrei Kistikovsky, the co-translator, uh, co further delayed the publication of other parts of the trilogy. Uh, Kistikovsky had been working at the Solzhenitsyn Aid Fund, and in 1983, after the arrest of the former coordinator, became the head of it. Um, he already knew that he was terminally ill, and he was prosecuted by the government till his death in 1987, and the next um, part of the translation would be, really, would be published just in 1990. In conclusion, I would like to say that uh, we can see uh, that the, the representation of medieval ages in Soviet unofficial culture was very diverse, but we can see several tendencies, uh, two classic models of perception of mid Middle Ages, the Renaissance one and the Romantic one, were modified uh, to the, due to the political and cultural context. The Dark Ages myth was changed to represent the oppressive state, um, and uh, the dissident living in this dark age was sometimes depicted as a brave knight, as a chaotic character who is fighting the dark forces of the state machine. The romantic medievalistic myth was in the spirit tied up with the mythical uh, West, uh, the goal of many Soviet uh, dissidents and immigrants. It also could represent any territory of the free thought and free speech that could be found. Thus, another mutation of the Romantic myth was born, the medieval magic realm, uh, constructed by Samizdat and uh, Western fantasy literature prohibited in the uh, USSR. It uh, could represent the escapist attitudes and some intimate relationships with the art or with uh, something transcendent with God. So that will be it uh, with my uh, paper. Thank you very much for your attention.